Besides, besides education, though, what other cultural factors are at play here, though? Because I, I, I think it, it seems uh, easy enough to suggest that more education needs to be done. Some of the talks that have been presented here over the last couple of days have been streamed to schools, for example. What other cultural factors do you think are at play here that uh, has made these numbers hardly budge over the last 30 to 40 years? It's very difficult to be sure, but I think, I think truly the standard of education uh, in developed countries are not as, as, as good as they may have been. Uh, and I think when seeing a similar sort of problem, not just in the biological sciences, but I think in many of the sciences, and uh, I have experience recently of working as a result of my connections with a university in the United States, the Stony Brook University. I mean, basically, more and more young people are being shown how they can access through the web information but because it's there they don't learn it and because it's there they don't interconnect it they don't we're not teaching people to think we're teaching people to push buttons to get information to answer questions in school and questions in college <laughs> this, this this to me is wrong and 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 we need to recognize that unless young minds can be encouraged to think how can they think later? And if they can't think later, I mean, don't worry about us. But we, as a, as a species of 7 billion, are dependent to a very large extent. 90% of the population of the world is dependent on basically three crops. Corn, rice, and the cereal wheat, in one form or the other. <laughs> the genetic base of those highly uh, productive, yielding crops has been narrowed down by the clearance of areas to grow them with very little of the natural base from which they were genetically derived in the breeding programs. What happens if, if, if a pathogen develops mm. in corn or in wheat or in, in, in one of the rice, as has be begun to show up, where you can eliminate in a few years the entire production of cereals mm. around the world because of a wind-blown disease uh, or treatment-resistant disease that would affect those crops? What sort of starvation are we looking at? Mm. And we need young people in, in India, we need young people in Kenya, we need young people in Brazil who are up to the challenge of, of understanding this could happen and up to the challenge of making sure that it doesn't. Let's not worry about us per se, but us in terms of the way we live and how we're living has to take in the biological perspective if we're to survive in the form that we know we are today. Dr. Johansson, so, so you've been busy since Lucy, as you, as you mentioned. Uh, good to hear. You just got back as well from Tanzania and South Africa. What, what, what are you working on now? I mean, when, when you're thinking uh, about the, this, this field and your work, uh, what do you do when you go out on one of these trips? What is your process? Are there specific questions that you're still trying to answer? I think there, there are two major areas that uh, are most interesting to to me and to the Institute of Human Origins, where we have a number of scientists working uh, in Ethiopia and South Africa. And that is one of the topics that Richard touched on, which is the emergence of Homo sapiens. And what prompted uh, that appearance of modern Homo sapiens? When did it occur? Where did it occur? Uh, we have a scientist who's working in South Africa. Uh, I visited his site recently. And there's good evidence there of tools that don't show up in Europe till about 40,000 years. He's finding them as old as 75 or 100,000 years finding innovations such as heat treatment of stone for the manufacture of stone tools that didn't appear in Europe till about 30,000 years ago, that first appeared in southern Africa. The use of ochre in body decoration, for example. The emergence or glimmerings of art, one of the things that distinguishes us. So I think that that's one area that we are spending a lot of effort on, trying to understand the oldest Homo sapiens, when we came out of Africa, but when those innovations occurred, and they seem to be tied to climatic changes. At around 200,000 years ago, there was an extended period of a prolonged, very cold climate that is coincident with the emergence of our own species, and as well as uh, coincident with the emergence of a number of these innovations. The other area where we work in Ethiopia is targeting sediments that are between two and three million years. I alluded to this in my presentation, that we are very interested in trying to understand the emergence of our own genus. We know a great deal about Australopithecus. We know, we are beginning to know about some of these more ancient areas of uh, human evolution, but we really would like to know a lot more about the origins of our own genus Homo. 
Um, Dr. Leakey, what, you know, you, you talked about this a little bit in your speech, but what um, do you think ma makes us human? You know, I read this article recently about the fact that when we evolve, is it, is it perhaps uh, in the future this idea that um, human beings, the way that we know human beings could be replaced by computers? I mean, could they do what we human beings do, which raised the question in my own mind, what makes us human beings? I think that the, the two questions that, that, that I'd like to address, one is um, one that we, we are guilty of often saying that we separated from the apes. And that gave lie to the, the, the search for the missing link, this common ancestor between apes and, and humans. And I think one has to, one steps back a little bit in, in, in later life, one realizes that we actually haven't separated at all. Um, we are apes. We're just another species, another, an, another complicated group of apes that walk around on two legs. Many of our closest relatives have become extinct and we have survived. But there was no sort of omega moment where, wow, suddenly we have something completely new. It was a very gradual different process. So evolution didn't, didn't cause that dramatic origin of humans. And I think what makes us human depends where you want to cut it. Clearly. Uh, our use of technology today and our, 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 our dependency on, on um, the lifestyles that we've grown accustomed to, whether it's the very poor or the very rich, is part of what makes modern humans in the 21st century modern humans in the 21st century, and there's very little comparison to them and people who lived in the 16th century. But they were humans. Um, does humanity require that, that, that we have the capacity to score highly in the Mensa tables or with IQ tests? Well, there are clearly people who, who can't do the Mensa or the IQ tests for a variety of medical reasons, and yet they're perfectly human. Mm. Um, so how, how do you want to cut this? Where, where do you want to draw this line? Is it because we have a large brain relative to body size? Well, yes, but if you start looking at modern humans in anatomical departments of medical schools, as you probably know from your own training, it's not always the bigger brains that, that are the smartest people. It, it, you know, it, it, it doesn't work as simply as you would like to suggest if you say big brains are important. These things are all relative. And I have long toyed with this idea that somehow technology is an important part of being human. But when you have several, as Don has explained, different species of hominid, whether they're Homo or Australopithecus or whether they're pumpkins and apples. I mean, it doesn't really matter what we call them, but there were several different things going on at the same time. And you have evidence of basic crude technology in terms of cutting objects. Are we sure who made those tools? Mm -hmm. Who accessed the meat diet through those tools? Uh, do we rule out the other candidates? Or do, do, are, are we not being driven by a, a desire to simplify to a point where we're doing this? So is tool making necessarily a criteria for being human? And I think one would have to say probably not, unless you redefine tools. And so this whole thing starts to get very complicated, and, and, and I think it depends where you draw it. But I think one of the most fundamental points at which this story might start is bipedalism, and I think this search for the, the first biped, if you like, which Don alluded to in terms of the growing debate about Ardipithecus and whether it had a toe that prevented it walking on two mm. legs habitually or whether it was clambering around in the trees on top of the branches and sometimes was upright hanging on to the center trunk. Good heavens, we could talk about that forever. The point is that bipedalism does seem to set us apart from the other apes. And it's not just that they walked upright, but they adapted their hips and their back and their limb bones for a, a habitual upright bipedal posture. That is, if you like, the beginning of this story. But I think a much more interesting part of it, well, not more interesting, but equally interesting story, is, is when, when did we learn to, to use language to do things that nothing else does? When did we put syntax into our... When could we express ideas that weren't simply go, come, stop, run, danger, food, but actually starting to discuss where the danger might come from and where the food might come from in the next season and, and how we relate. When did compassion come about? When, when did we start worrying 
about the survival of an individual. Empathy, if you like, or compassion. Well, it's something that's very simple. I never really thought about it. But as some of you know, I lost both legs in an accident some years ago. And if you're a two-legged creature and you have no legs, you don't go very far. Even if they give you one artificial leg and you only have one leg, you're still totally dependent on somebody feeling sorry for you or caring for you or thinking they can get something from you if you get better. Um, whatever motive you want to apply. But being a uniped is no better than being a noped. <laughs> Whereas if you're a chimpanzee or a baboon or a lion or a dog and you have four legs, you can lose one and do perfectly well. You can actually, in case of domestic dogs, lose two and still do pr pretty well, provided they're diagonally removed and not on, all on one side. <laughs> now, once we became bipedal, and this comes back to the story, bonding and, 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 and uh, social, social interactions takes on a totally different, not just meaning, but value. And I do not believe bipedal primates could have survived unless they had, in addition to being bipedal, changed the way they think in terms of altruism and in terms of, 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 of social networking and social connections. And it's all very well to say, you know, we, we love the mother of our children. The hell we do. We do as long as we can have children with her, but once they're born, men tend to take off. <laughs> so I think that's a primary character. And I don't think sex is the basis of bonding. I think it's much more fundamental. It's survival. Your question, so, you know, your question of what does it mean to be human has been addressed by uh, anthropologists for centuries. And some people say you're not human until you're bipedal. Other people say you're not bi human until you start making tools. Some people say you're not human until you have an enlarged brain. And that the, you, you don't immediately become magically human by stepping into this evolutionary tunnel as an ape and walking out as a fully formed human. So that these are things that accumulate over time and make other things possible. And ultimately, of course, the thing that makes us most unique and different from all creatures is the ability to think symbolically. I think this is really the defining feature, something that we don't have paleo tape recorders. We don't know what paleo language was like. But when we do encounter early human ancestors, maybe as old as 75,000 years, who are beginning to leave their mark by engraving a piece of ochre that ultimately evolves into something like what we see in these marvelous rock paintings that are all over South Africa, East Africa, and of course the ones we know best in Herzog's new film, the Chauvet film, uh, in the upper Paleolithic of Europe. We had, that is the, the final major distinguishing feature that makes us so different from all other animals. But yet, on the other hand, the more we study the apes, as Richard said, we are, we've been called the bipedal ape, the naked ape, the stupid ape, or whatever. But we are certainly, we're finding by studying our closest relatives that it blurs a little bit, that apes, particularly chimpanzees, do make and use rudimentary tools. Mm -hmm. They use rudimentary tools to crack open nuts. They use rudimentary tools to termite fish, for example. They do show signs of compassion. There are apes that uh, Jane Goodall has studied where a young baby has died from grief over the death of its mother. So these sorts of things all have their glimmerings, probably much deeper in the past than we ever thought. And that is something to look at on the other side of this coin, not so much what makes us human, but are there glimmerings and indications from studies of our closest relatives that this is part of a continuum, that it isn't a magic moment when a finger comes out and touches us and makes us human. This is a continuum. This is an evolutionary change and tinkering over time. And that, again, is something that gives us a much better understanding of who we are. We are not separately, sort of, uniquely brought about. We are part of this continuum. We are one branch on it. And we can look at our closest living relatives, the, the African apes, and see glimmerings of what it might mean to be human. We got, we, got a, we got a lot of uh, questions from the audience here, so I'm going to try and get to as many, many of these as I can. Um, and let, let me start with you, uh, Dr. Leakey. Uh, uh, do you think the discovery of life beyond Earth will change opinions about the origins of life here on Earth? Do I think that the discovery of life beyond Earth um, 
change I, opinions about it. Would, would change our, the way we think about life here and our origins the here? The origins here on Earth. Yeah. Well, absolutely. I mean, I, I think the, the arrogance of thinking that we're unique uh, would be dealt a swift blow. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I can't wait for that to happen. Um, <laughs> I, I think it would be a wonderful thing to demonstrate beyond any doubt. I mean, I think there is already sufficient reason to believe there is life, whether it's life equivalent to us, and we're now falling into the trap that we think it'll be life like we have here. Let's hope not. <laughs> but that there will be life in other planets, um, unless you're prepared to be as arrogant as we have been for the last few centuries, surely it's there. Surely it's going to be different. Surely uh, it's going to be difficult to access it. And, you know, the analogy of an alien spacecraft going by and looking at the Earth and said, should we drop in? They say, no, that's a failed state. Let's move on to somewhere better. I think it's a very good one. <laughs> let, me, let, me, let me keep going. I'll uh, just go to get to the next question. Um, how or why did Homo sapiens develop in Eastern Africa and not elsewhere in the world? Uh, and maybe you could extrapolate to other species as well. Well, I think the conditions in Africa, both environmental and biological, uh, were perfectly poised for the emergence of Homo sapiens. And uh, it, whether it happened in Eastern Africa or Southern Africa, we know definitively that it happened in Africa. It did not happen in uh, glacial Europe. It did not happen in Asia. This is where we see things like Homo erectus and Neanderthals. Uh, Neanderthals are a wonderful example here of, of kind of understanding the origins of species like this. Because Neanderthals and we had a common ancestor. It's sometimes called Homo heidelbergensis, which is a strange name to use for uh, the origins of sapiens in Africa. But they were isolated genetically and environmentally in Europe and evolved into their own definitive species. We evolved in a tropical environment of, under very different conditions, under which hunter-gathering, for example, was something that was a very high selective value because they not only ate, it subsisted like Neanderthals did, solely on meat, but we subsisted on a very mixed diet of hunting and gathering. I think that the factors in Africa were very conducive to the origins of Homo sapiens. Let me get to this question with you, Dr. Leakey. If evolution never ceases, then what do you think humans will be like about a million years from now? Well, a million years from now, I think the process of extinction is likely to have... have <laughs> I was afraid you were going to say that. Re ...required further consideration. I mean, I think one needs to be very careful to understand that evolution doesn't happen because the clock is ticking. And I think there's a, there's a misconception that, that Darwin suggested that life will continue to change, irrespective, provided there is time thrown into, the, in, into, into this. It, it's far more important to recognize that for evolution to happen or physical change to happen or adaptive strategies to take effect, there has to be a, a, an underlying fundamental environmental pressure that drives organism to try doing things differently if they're going to survive. And I think it is, it, it is the lack of, of um, continuum in a stable habitat that has led to the appearance of new species and the extinction of others. The second part of this is, requires that a, a, a successful variant needs to be able to, to breed over a number of generations for that change to be fixed. Mm -hmm. And you probably, for humans, need 50 to 100 generations as a minimum, maybe longer, and we can't isolate human population for, for that long. And it's difficult to conceive of anything that could happen that would do that. Um, so I, I think physical evolution is not something we should, we should be worried about or, or expect other than medical interventions, but I don't think you can project those that far forward. And people say, well, what examples do you have of evolution not occurring? Well, the coelacanth, which lives in the Indian Ocean in the deep bottom of the sea, 600 meters or more down in the Indian Ocean and probably other tropical oceans, the coelacanth hasn't changed, what, for 100 million, 150 million years? And it's because where he lives, or it lives, hasn't changed either. It's dark, high pressure, um, there's no change at all to the environment of the coelacanth. And without, without the change in the environment, the coelacanth, which we can now see, fortunately, by sending down probes and, and, and submarines, the coelacanth living happily amongst the dinosaurs, or the time of the dinosaurs, is still living happily amongst us. Um, they didn't see him, and nor did we, but he's there. <laughs> yeah. That's a, well, uh, just uh, yesterday, Richard's daughter, Louise, and I had uh, two sessions, wonderful sessions with educators and uh, high school students 
from uh, the city of New York who um, are really being taught to be thinkers, not just pushing buttons. And these kids uh, asked that same question. And I posed an interesting model, and that was the model of space exploration. Should we be successful in sending into space a mission for 200,000 years and then having them return after 200,000 years? The conditions that Richard was speaking of on that spacecraft, mutations, recombination, genetic drift, and so on, might very well have them evolve into a new species hmm. of Homo. And Fantastic. when they returned after 400,000 years to the very planet that sent them into space, they would not be able to interbreed with the very species that sent them out. That's fascinating. That's a, uh, let me, there let wouldn't me just be very many of them, probably. <laughs> <laughs> we'd, we'd fix them pretty quickly. <laughs> let me just ask, uh, follow up really quickly, Dr. Johansson. I mean, is, is it... Is it possible, given some of the external pressures, uh, you said environmental pressures, but I'll say external, that we are placing on ourselves in terms of um, uh, the, the cognitive decline, the lack of education, uh, the obesity crisis, could we start to de-evolve as human beings, become less efficient, uh, our brains actually becoming less productive? Could that happen? We talk about extinction, uh, but what about de-evolution? Well, I, I don't think so. I think there are enough genes being exchanged between populations around the planet that something, unless there is an extreme isolation of people who only eat Fritos, for example, and, not, and, and don't interbreed with anybody else, that might happen. Okay. Now you're scaring me. <laughs> but, but I don't think so. I think that genes are flowing in and out of populations globally. And it's one of the things that keeps us moving along more or less as the same species. I mean, we can board a plane tomorrow morning and to, to Australia and exchange genes. And the exchange of these genes <laughs> is it's true. The exchange He's of these genes that. <laughs> certainly keeps uh, the species moving along. The, the, uh, the, there's a couple questions that are sort of um, re repeating a little bit here. So I wanna, I'll, I'll try and um, reword these a little bit. But uh, for Dr. Leakey, it says, you spoke um, uh, a few years ago, they say, I guess they heard you speak before, about extinction of Homo sapiens. Um, when and why do you think that will happen? Now, that's what we're sort of talking about here. Uh, but these environmental pressures that you're alluding to, is there something that you uh, think about, worry about, forecast, uh, as far as driving that? I think the environmental pressures that we're looking at today, irrespective of what's causing them, and I think we, there's been a lot of debate in the media, the press, and the Western world about whether this is humanly caused or whether we're exacerbating it or whether we're responsible or whether we should do anything about it. But let's keep that aside. The fact is that last time there was major environmental change of the magnitude that we're seeing, things happened to Homo sapiens. Uh, and if you like, it was the beginning of agriculture. If you want to go further back than that, it probably seems to be connected to the origins of syntactic speech, which we see today. Clearly, today, with 7 billion people on the planet and heading for 10, environmental change of the magnitude that the first indications are suggesting we're going to face over the next 50 to 100 years are going to be so massive that there will be fundamental change to the way the planet operates in terms of the human population. We simply cannot sustain a hundred billion, uh, 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 ten billion people on the consumption patterns that we're looking at against the changes in climate that we're seeing beginning and which we can look geologically as having happened in the past. It's just too much. It can't be done. Uh, so that, that, I think, is a very fundamental cause of concern for me and it's particularly important in, in developing countries like you see in Africa. And 85, 90% of the world population is living at poverty or below poverty. And the impact on that population uh, of massive climate change that we're seeing is going to be very significant. But to put another side on that, if I smelt in Greenland and I smelt in, in the Arctic and I smelt in the Antarctic uh, is as described, and I've been to the Antarctic to have a look at it, and you can measure the amount of ice and you can see it beginning to melt quite dramatically, sea level rise is going to happen, and, and a, a rise of five meters of the ocean in the next 30 to 50 years 
kind of put most of the eastern seaboard under the United States in some difficulty, not to mention what happens on the western seaboard and what happens to the whole of Europe, and many countries will disappear in the Pacific and beyond. So, yes, I think in the next hundred years we're going to see fundamental changes to the way the world looks in terms of our existence on it. Uh, did, did you want to comment on that? I mean, do, is well, I, I, I would just comment and say that I think that the, that the human mind, the human brain, is infinitely inventive. And I think that it's uh, moments, is a, moments of challenge that really push us to our limits and have us make major breakthroughs in technologies, major breakthroughs in agriculture, major breakthroughs in all aspects of living. We are really culture-bound animals. We are the most plastic, we are the most adaptable uh, creature on the planet. And the changes that will come about will come about through technological and cultural changes. I'm not quite as pessimistic, I think, as Richard is. I think that the species is aware that there are signals that species are dying out, that they're, they're going extinct, they're disappearing, we are overusing land, and so on. And I think that people are beginning to put on their thinking caps and figuring out how to use new sources of energy, how to make energy go further, how to make crops go further, and, and to be much more vigilant about the sorts of things that have brought us to where we are now. We are, in many ways, introspective species, even though I call this homo egocentricus, and we have a mind that is infinitely inventive. And I think that culturally, for instance, if glaciers came back, people in New York City just wouldn't grow hair, they just put on a, a coat or put on, turn up the heat in the environment that they're living in. So I, I, I'm somewhat more optimistic about the future, I think. The, the, um, uh, th this, has, this is a question more to do with, with I think, specific process. Uh, and, and let me ask you, Dr. Lee, with the, with the advent, the question is of more sophisticated genomic sequencing, um, can evolutionary anthropologists use these techniques to fill in some of the gaps? Say that again, sorry, I'm the, the, uh, echo. Uh, uh, I think they're talking about using genomic sequencing as a tool, as a route of exploration to try and fill in some of the gaps. Could evolutionary anthropologists use that as a tool? Yes, I think, I think absolutely. I think they already are, to some extent, yeah, right? Yeah, absolutely certain, for sure. Um, but I think the fossil record is also very important, and I think the, 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 the genetic evidence is, 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 is what it is. The genomic work that's being done is, is fabulous. But I think we do need a fossil record because we need to look not just at the human story, but we look at, look at the story of life and what has happened to life in the, in the, in the broader picture, the bigger theater of, of the changes that have happened on this planet over the last three and a half billion years. I think that's what's, what's important in putting us in perspective. I think putting our own origins in a clearer focus, the work on genes is going to be enormously important at, at, at pushing some of the frontiers that seem to be out of, out of reach at the moment to the fossil record, the archaeological record. I think what we're learning from that is, is hugely important. But I think the bigger picture will be told by a combination of different techniques of investigation. And I think we want to be careful to try to remember that if we're talking about something that is true, all the lines should be congruent when we get to the end of the, the investigation. Working all in the same direction, yes, please. I think, we're using I think we're using genetics very effectively to understand human migrations, as uh, Richard talked about. But we also are, are limited by the fact that biological material does not last very long. You need to have DNA, to, obviously, to do this genetic profiling. And we have Neanderthals at 100,000 years where we're beginning to see good DNA. And through that DNA, we're beginning to see that Neanderthals were different from us, but there was also a period of time, perhaps 100,000 years ago, the geneticists are suggesting, when we were, able to, we were capable of interbreeding with Neanderthals. But beyond that, we really don't have any good genetic material in the fossil record. We can use genetic similarities and differences to help classify animals and plants. We can use them to help reconstruct sort of the, the family tree or phylogeny of when certain branches came off. But certainly, uh, we, we will not be able to say what the genetics of, say, Lucy was, for example. Now, the, the last year, when uh, it was announced that within the next couple of years, the scientists in Leipzig will have a complete genome sequence of a Neanderthal. One of the questions that was debated was whether or not we should now take that complete sequence of Neanderthals, because after all, Homo sapiens was 
maybe not directly, but indirectly responsible for the extinction of Neanderthals, should we now backbreed to Neanderthals and bring them back after destroying them? But the moral question is, what would you do with the Neanderthal? Put them in the state legislature. <laughs> You, you had that, did you have that planned? You no, just I teed didn't. that up for yourself, didn't, I didn't. you? I, I think international travel through airports of the world suggests that they're not all gone anyway. <laughs> <laughs> when you, when you um, look at all the various routes of exploration, Dr. Johansson, and, and you're still you know, traveling, you just have uh, been uh, in uh, Ethiopia and uh, in South Africa. W when you're using all these various routes of exploration, are, are, are there specific, only specific areas uh, in these countries where you can you can do your work. I mean, how, how is that determined where, where, you, where your team can actually excavate and, and, uh, and, and look for fossils? Sure, that, that's a very good uh, question. It was, it was like the old days in uh, California when we saw the gold rush. Uh, in this sense, we sort of have the hominid rush. Everybody wants to go find their early human ancestor. And the governments, particularly Ethiopia, where I've worked since 1970, allocate uh, places, uh, geographic regions, that are in our permit area. Mm. So this is a permit that is issued to us as individuals where we can consistently work um, without any difficulty whatsoever. And scientists who work nearby do not impinge on other scientist areas. We respect these sorts of boundaries. And uh, so we do have well-defined areas where we work. If there are budding anthropologists, uh, Dr. Leakey, listening, I mean, how, how does one go about, you know, starting that, uh, get, getting a permit, just beginning in this field? Well, I think it's slightly different in Kenya. Um, the, the paleontological prehistoric research requires some form of permits, but I think, generally speaking, they're not bounded by the boundaries that exist in Ethiopia. They're, they're more site-specific or time-specific or much broader areas, and I think, if scientists continue to collaborate, cooperate, and talk to each other, it becomes less important that you put boundaries around them. And I think restrictions of the kind that I think we've seen in Ethiopia may ultimately be counterproductive in that scientists are not talking to each other. And you yourself have alluded to the fact with me that at times you've been up to, to, to Addis and you wanted to look at material that has been published and you've been denied access to look at that material in its original form. Yeah. Now, I think that is very counterproductive and, mm. and, and inappropriate. And I think we need to be very conscious of the fact that if we use public money to find things, and we, once we've published them and we've got our first data out, there needs to be a more mature approach to sharing data. And I think, unfortunately, it's part of the world that we live in where you want to keep things very close to yourself, you want to have um, longer than is reasonable access because it helps you raise money for the next grant, you want to have your own opportunity to make a headline and I think the funding mechanism that goes into scientific advance in prehistory at any rate in anthropology has probably got a lot to answer for in terms of pushing scientists to demand, to, to try to find headline material, to try to, to monopolize uh, the work that they've done in a way that I think is counterintuitive to looking for the truth. And I, and I think there are big areas where dialogue and, and, and consultation uh, are necessary today. Let, let, me, let me just follow up quickly. We just got a couple more minutes left. But you know, when you t all the things that you were talking about uh, in terms of where the questions that you still want to answer on your explorations, taking into account all these routes of exploration, um, are you optimistic we're going to find those answers, given the state of science now, given uh, the interest in this particular field? Well, I think that if we look long and hard enough and widely enough, we will find the right geological deposits between two and three million years when our genus uh, arose. We have, and, and Richard has in mind some places in, um, in Kenya, there are other colleagues in Ethiopia we work with that have uh, uh, ideas of where to look for that. I think we'll solve that problem. I think that whether or not Neanderthals could sort of sit around and speak to one another like we are today, that's a more difficult problem. But if we look at the circumstantial evidence that Neanderthals did not create art like we have, they probably did not have symbolic syntactic language like we do. 
There will be lots of questions. Will we get back to a point where we get so close to that common ancestor, to the African apes and ourselves, that we will not be able to make a decision by looking at a list of characteristics as to whether it belongs on our tree or an ape tree? There are a lot of mysteries, and the one thing that you said that caught my ear was that, yes, I would encourage young people to get involved in this field, not just to go out and stake your claim as to where you might find fossils, but to get involved with the, on the analytical side, because new techniques are coming along all the time that are allowing us to extract even more and more information from these fossils. Uh, a colleague in England, for example, has been using uh, scanning techniques to look at the, the inner ear, at the semicircular canals, and say something about the locomotor abilities. We never thought that we'd use something like that. So I would encourage people, young students and our students at ASU, to not just go out and try to find their fossil, but to get involved on the analytical side. This is not just a discovery-driven field. This is a field that needs good minds, people who can really analyze and understand these features and add a new significant fact or bit of understanding to where we came from. Let me just add one point to that, because I'm, I'm going to, to take it to a more contemporary issue, and I think we are well within the grasp of being able to demonstrate that bigotry and prejudice has no scientific basis, and it is purely bigotry and prejudice that are driving some of the divides that separate people of the world today. And I think if we can make it understood and clear that irrespective of our superficial features, we are one people and we owe it to each other to respect each other as one species, one people with one origin. We may get over some of the hurdles that the 21st century are offering us and I think this sort of research may go towards that. You know, uh, I was going to ask another question but I think that might be a, a perfect point on which to leave it. How about a, a nice round of applause for Dr. Johansson and Nikki.